everyone, Alex Dunn here, and today I am going to be sharing my favorite books of 2021. The best books of 2021, which is always going to be relative to what you read and what your taste is. So I do prefer to say favorites, especially because on the flip side, I prefer to say most disappointing because none of the ones that were the most disappointed to me are bad. But this year I am filming them separately because we know how long winded I am about books. So this is the books I read this year that I loved. I had an even 10 and then I finished one more. And so I am going to cheat. I'm going to do 11 instead of 10 and I'm going to divide these into fiction and nonfiction because I read so much nonfiction this year that made my final list. And that said, I did have a really weird reading year, honestly, which I chronicled in my various reading wrap ups. I drafted a book this year, plus the ongoing pressures of the worldwide panini have really generally shifted my reading tastes. Like I was always a mood reader and now it's even worse. And what I've been in the mood for is like, very particular kinds of thrillers and nonfiction where terrible things happen. So <laughs> you're gonna notice a trend in some of the books I read, but I mean, I read some books I really, really loved this year. As always, these books are in no particular order, so the order I go in does not reflect like most favorite to least favorite, and I'm going to start with nonfiction. The first book is The Third Pull by Mark Sinat. I just finished this one last week and it is part of my mountaineering disaster kick, a theme you're going to notice in at least one other book that I mention. And I read this after reading a different Everest book and feeling slightly dissatisfied. Like it was just a straight up memoir and I really like cultural and historical context huge nerd for these things. I also was really looking for a perspective that talked about things like reducing the Sherpa people to a noun for porters and the Westerners taking advantage of people in the regions of Nepal and Tibet and so on. And I got an extra dose of like really interesting world politics with this one as well. Because the third poll is all about a journalist and mountaineer being on an expedition team sponsored by National Geographic, there was a documentary made about it to try to find the body of Sandy Irvine. Sandy Irvine climbed Mount Everest with George Mallory. They both perished in the attempt in 1924, quite famously. Mallory's body was found in 1999 after all of those years. But what they didn't find with Mallory was the camera that they were carrying as a team. And scientists said this particular kind of camera if they found it, it was very likely that the film would survive and they'd be able to develop any pictures and prove whether or not Mallory and Irvine made the summit before they died. It has been hotly contended for nearly a hundred years. And so this expedition went to Mount Everest in 2019 to reclimb the same route that they climbed from the north side, which is the Tibet side of the mountain, which is where it gets into some really interesting politics with China. Long story short, because I'm gonna go over this book in my winter wrap up as well, because I just read it. I adored this book. It was such a good read. It scratched exactly the itch I wanted. And I'm on another nonfiction mountaineering kick. Like every couple of years I go into one because this book was so, so good. If any of what I just said sounds interesting to you, Mark, I really liked the way that he wrote it. It's very like, how they put together their documentary and going to the mountain and like the play-by-play -play of what happened, but really fantastic narrative sections going over the history. He made the history so interesting, though I, I already like history, so it's not hard to please me. But I think that readers who don't typically read nonfiction, who don't typically read history, will find the blending of the history and the now really interesting. I definitely did. And 2019 was the year that Everest broke famously. The picture posted of like hundreds of people uh, b lined up for the summit, like in, a, in like a backlog and a ton of people died. And they were on the mountain that year, but they were on the other side and they weren't going for a summit push when that photo was taken. But the book covers that and chronicles the stories of several people who both did and did not die that season. And those sections are told in this like brilliant, I was on the edge of my seat in the narrative section. And it's quite heartbreaking because a couple of the narratives that he like dives into are people who perished. I love that kind of fiction, like really making the mountaineering 
narrative and immersive and like edge of your seat they read it reads like a good non-fiction book about something like this reads like a thriller and so i adored the third poll and highly recommend it and so my next favorite this is where i edged the list up to 11. i just finished last night savage summit by jennifer jordan and i love this one for similar reasons this one is about the women of k2 the book is a bit older it was published in 2000 2005, and so at that time only five women had had summited K2 and all of them were dead. Three died climbing K2, like reached the summit and died on the way down. Two had survived their successful summit but died on other 8,000 meter peaks within six years. And so the book chronicles those five women, like it's like it's a biography, it's an adventure novel, like you get to know each of the women and what drove them to climb mountains and a the people who they knew and they're they're messy and fascinating and some of them made very stupid choices that literally led to their deaths and the book is this exploration of that and of sexism in mountaineering through that lens because in some of the cases uh, Jennifer Jordan is asking the question did the women make this or that choice? Was this or that unsafe or less safe that led to their death because they were isolated from their male teammates who, you know, there's there's some pretty awful stories. Like, you know, the woman who couldn't go to the bathroom for six hours because all the men on her trip kept following her to, you know, because they're hiking on glaciers, uh, kept following her to ridicule her, pulling down her pants and being naked. Uh, sexual harassment, jealousies and pettiness over exes and who's sleeping with whom, all of that kind of stuff. And as I said, the women were portrayed very honestly and in some cases messily, and I just loved it as a journalistic portrait of real people asking interesting questions but not necessarily coming up with the answers. And I would even say in a couple of cases, I'm not 100% sure I agree with what I'm pretty sure the journalist Jennifer Jordan B thinks and believes and that's what's so interesting she presents these true stories of these women mountaineers and the choices they made that led to their deaths and you get to you know extrapolate from there but it was also fun because essentially she's giving you a lot of the history of k2 and k2 ascents and climbing and all there are all these famous mountaineers who are mentioned in the book who are familiar to you if you've read into thin air and that's one of my all-time favorite books so it was like oh there's scott fisher and rob hall and anatoly bukreev like names that were familiar to me and it was just that actually helped me form a a, a broader picture of them as climbers and honestly just makes me want to reread Into Thin Air. But I loved this book, devoured it. I'm reading some more mountaineering books, so that may shape my 2022 lists. But yeah, these two books, like first The Third Pole and then Savage Summit, they are different. Like The Third Pole is definitely a little more like, a lot more of the history, because it's specifically about trying to find the body of a, a person from 1924. Just perfect examples of like, edge of your seat narrative like mountaineering adventure fiction and if you're even like vaguely interested in the ideas of 8,000 meter mountaineering and kind of the types of people who climb them i recommend both of those books so the next nonfiction book i loved in 2021 was the woman they could not silence by kate more and i'll say it was actually tricky like i almost put radium girls on this list as well but i decided to make myself pick one generally speaking if you are interested in narrative non-fiction specifically that focuses on lesser known women in history look to kate more radium girls was amazing but the woman they could not silence just like floored me woman i'd never heard of check fascinating real life issues still relevant today, which is women, the patriarchy, just society in general ment and mental health and how easy it can be for a vulnerable person to be called crazy and literally put away. Like in the era of Free Britney and her conservatorship, which thankfully is finally over, it's more relevant than ever. And what is the woman they could not silence about? It's this woman from the 1860s, uh, her husband, was fed up with her because how dare she talked a lot, expressed her opinions, specifically opinions that 
where she didn't always agree with her husband, including leaving his sector of Christianity because he was a pastor and joining a different church. And to add insult to injury, his church was pro-slavery. So we know how we feel about him. Like, how dare Elizabeth be an abolitionist? This woman is clearly insane. Literally. He had his wife committed and it was shockingly easy and the whole book goes into the history of how shockingly easy it was for husbands to have their wives committed or fathers because women didn't have any rights and they were indeed considered property. And all it took was a husband saying, she talks all the time and has lots of opinions. This is a clear sign of insanity, which that was the bar at the time and so she's committed to this asylum and she's not she's not crazy and it's about her fight to free herself to free herself and then to change the law and spoiler alert it's history but essentially it, it is one of the first major pieces of reform in that related to power that husbands had over their wives and specifically related to being able to commit someone and it's just really, really fascinating. And as I said, Kate Moore is brilliant at narrative nonfiction. You are in Elizabeth's POV. It is written like fiction. And as you're reading it, you go, I can't believe this really happened. And it's immaculately sourced. There's all of these footnotes. And it is just a fascinating real life story. And I, it, it, just the excitement I experienced reading it that like uniquely like really juicy nonfiction can do for me and that's the thing I was just like edge of my seat because I knew so little of the history and like going in you're reading it you're knowing well she must have succeeded in doing something phenomenal if she is the subject of a piece of nonfiction but you don't know any of the details you're like oh my god I can't believe that happened and then her husband showed up and how dare you know the guy that ran the asylum like oh what it what it there there are all these great villains in the story and and heroes and it was really really good so if it sounds like a piece of history that's exciting to you even if you don't typically read nonfiction, I highly recommend it because it reads so much like fiction it's just so expertly written and I absolutely adored it and so the last but definitely not least nonfiction title that was a favorite of mine in 2021 was Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe. So this is all about the Sacklers who own Purdue, the company behind OxyContin. And it is a family saga told in three parts and it really goes deep specifically into the family that wrought this. Like what kind of people, what kind of family, what kind of legacy would bring us here to where we are, the oxy epidemic, just the, the socio, corporate sociopathy of like, who cares if this kills people money? And you get a chronicle of that starting with the patriarch of the family, the, the forefather of the family, Arthur Sackler, who really put into motion modern, I mean, so much of what we know of the modern pharmaceutical industry actually and that's part of what i found so fascinating about reading it like you're what like it starts in like the the 1910s and you're literally walked up to present of like how and like learning that arthur sackler was like the godfather the father of modern pharmaceutical advertising uh how he basically like founded organizations like the advertising agency and the medical journal and then he, he bought Purdue for his brothers and basically the pharmaceutical company, the advertising agency, and the medical journal all owned by the same family and that's so wrong on so many levels. Uh, and it's just a really fascinating portrait of this specific family, their legacy, and how the whole oxy epidemic how it all happened and went down and the the long rocky fight to bring this family to account and we're finally seeing that happen uh you know recently the met finally agreed to take their name uh off of all of these exhibits in the museum and you get the whole history of that how arthur sackler was obsessed with art specifically uh asian art and how he spent millions of dollars on these things and like he had a special like office at the met and you get all of this really interesting history and I am a nerd for that kind of thing and I mean if you are vaguely interested in the whole oxy thing and the Sacklers if you if you liked Bad Blood which was one of my favorite reads of last year by John Carreyou about Theranos read Empire of Pain it's a very similar read in the sense that you're getting a similar like deep dive into a family into a story and I just 
I really like those sorts of things and one of my favorite reads of 2021. Which brings us to the fiction section. So the rest of the books are all like fiction I liked and it's me so you know that they're all they're all suspense thrillers. <laughs> I only read two things nowadays so in no particular order just like with the non-fiction. A Familiar Sight by Brianna Labuskas. This this I would actually class as like the most surprising book of 2021 for me in the sense that like is an author I hadn't heard of. It's a book I picked up from uh, I think it was either I think it was a Kindle first reads and it just like I almost did like the, the cover like didn't tell me much and I almost didn't pick it up but I it had to be Kindle first reads because I read the editor letter and as soon as I saw that the main character is diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and they're the protagonist and they help the police solve crimes I was like okay and it was one of my favorite books of 2021. A really good thriller if you like those sorts of thrillers. And I normally don't like them where like a professional teams up with a cop and like it's like detective fiction style murder books. But I loved this one. It's got multi timelines, multi POVs, all centering around the question of did this I think 11 year old girl brutally murder her mother? And you get the POV of her father both before and after and kind of grappling with the question of there's something wrong with Violet but what what do we do and the main character Dr. Gretchen White you know that when she was a child she may or may not have murdered her aunt the cops certainly think that she did it but there was never any proof she was found standing over the body and it's that cop who investigated that case who later brought her in to consult with the Boston PD and Gretchen literally relates to Violet though being a suspect in a brutal murder at a young age having this personality disorder and Gretchen herself you know she has to explore like does she think Violet did it while investigating what really happened with this brutal murder and also the death of her friend who was the lawyer um who was friends with the dad and it's just it's this tangled web who's lying and why and kind of the faces that we show the world including that you can have someone in front of you who's a very obvious suspect something that Gretchen relates to intimately you know she knows herself and she knows what she did and didn't do but that doesn't stop other people from like making assumptions and judging her which was what draws her to this case but like you as a reader, because you know, you, you bring these expectations to the genre, I certainly did. I loved playing the game of like, who is and isn't what they seem to be. And I also just loved the layer of Gretchen as an unreliable narrator, which she like admits to the reader even that she has trained herself to like read people and be able to interpret neurotypical people as best she can. But she even she knows that sometimes she's wrong. And that is so fun for you as the reader, because there's also that layer of like, did she interpret that person right? Did she get that tone right? And I thought that that just added a really fun like layer to it. And because I already like domestic suspense, I loved the back and forth with the dad's POV like before the murder and after the murder of his wife. And oh, it was it was it was really, really good. So if any of that sounds appealing to you, I definitely recommend it. I have an arc of the next book which comes out in March and I'm going to well, as soon as I get off this mountaineering kick, that that is probably going to be my next read because I cannot wait. The next book is her solving her aunt's murder and essentially clearing her name. She was never convicted or, or even arrested but like she still works with the cop of the Boston PD who like deep down inside he thinks that she did it and I cannot wait to explore that murder from the past so highly highly recommend. The next book is The Push by Ashley Audrain. I mean this one is brutal. I mean <laughs> <laughs> is it a good thing or a bad thing that so many of my favorites are like really really dark but most thrillers are dark. This one is all about I mean it comes with content warnings and I said it in my review of the book and this book is not going to be for everyone because of that. Uh, it is a woman who has her marriage has fallen apart she's divorced from her husband and it starts with her watching him and his new family at Christmas. She's literally staring through their windows lovely and creepy and she is writing a letter to him basically saying like I have to tell you my side. 
I have to tell you what I know and I believe. And you know the things that in Messily, and you know from the back cover copy, this is the content warning. It's a spoiler, but it's in the copy. And you need to know. This mother is convinced that something is wrong with her daughter. And this is the crux of what she's trying to explain to her ex-husband in this, this letter, in this journal that she's writing to him, explaining her side. And this is all leading up to as I said, you know this from the back cover copy, and it's important to know going in. Um, something happened to her other child, her younger child, her son, and she is convinced that her daughter did it, that her daughter caused the death of her son. But you as the reader are reading this as, did she? <laughs> Is this a mother who had postpartum depression and this impacted how she views her daughter? Is this a woman who comes from a legacy of bad mothers? Because you also get little snapshots of her mother and her grandmother before her. So you get these narrative sections split throughout the book, which gives you insight into the narrator's own childhood, Blythe's childhood, uh, and just the legacy that she inherited, which is a mother and a grandmother who by the time each of their daughters was 11 years old was gone. They were disconnected, unemotional mothers, abusive mothers who in one case took their own life and in the case of Blythe's mother simply left her. She didn't want to be a mother anymore and so you as the reader are seeing this and it builds as a narrative and you bring to the reading of it, Blythe comes from this legacy of mothers who don't love their their daughters, mothers who don't love their children. And it begs so many questions about the point of view from which you are getting this story. And it's messy and it's complex and it's intense and she makes so many bad choices, but it's fascinating and I loved every minute of it. I love these kinds of stories. Like, you know, I, who, who didn't love that trash movie, The Good Son? <laughs> 90s. Maybe I just loved it because I had a crush on Elijah Wood, but I loved that movie. And it asked those similar questions. An older reference would be the bad seed of like, is there something wrong with the child? Or is it the mother's perception? And you get to judge that for yourself. I will say the book does give you a pretty definitive answer at the end. So if you're annoyed by ones that leave it up to you as the reader and leave things open ended, this book doesn't do that. Um, which I which I like. <laughs> I like that it, you got to the end and you go, okay. I loved it. I loved the experience of reading it. Just like such a delightful surprise. But is it, it is a dark, dark, difficult book to read. Um, but if you are fans of kind of domestic suspense, um, multi timeline, like potentially unreliable narrator type thrillers, I do recommend it. But you have to go in knowing the content warning that I gave like child death in the book. It is it is a lot. But it asks a lot of questions about motherhood and marriage and and all that kind of stuff. And I, I really liked it. On that theme, <laughs> it was a dark year. Another favorite of mine was People Like Her by Ellery Lloyd, which is another book that asks a lot of questions about motherhood, parenthood, marriage, but the real strong lens here is social media. It is all about an Instagram influencer, a mommy influencer, and the face she shows to the world and the choices that she makes versus the private life. But the consequences of those things. It was a fun, zippy, soapy read. You go back and forth between the wife and the husband as someone is stalking them and specifically the wife and you don't know who and you don't know why at first. But this one also comes with very strong content warnings similar to The Push. And I don't know why there's a theme of this in the books I read in 2021. Like I swear I didn't intentionally pick up these books for this reason because with people like her you don't know ahead of time but I'm telling you content warning um child uh, endangerment baby baby in danger uh content warning which I think is you need to have because it is quite harrowing and a lot of people can't handle reading that but I liked the sharpness of this book and what it had to say specifically about influencer culture specifically parent influencer culture and like mommy shaming and 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 just like generally the people who some people pretend to be on social media and actually that that not everyone pretends but in order to reach 
certain heights, you you have to be fake on, on a certain level. There has to be a level of curation to who you are on the internet, and it examines that, and I love that kind of thing. Next, and again, just the dark themes. I really loved When All the Stars Go Dark by Paula McLean. This is one I read much earlier in the year, but when I sat down to make this list, it was it's one of those that just kind of stuck to my ribs. Um, like, I just, like, viscerally remember so much of the reading experience of it. And it actually represents something slightly unusual for me. I typically don't read more literary fiction upmarket, but I would definitely consider this an upmarket suspense book. Um, no dead children. Uh, oh, wow. Oh. Hmm. Actually, not, not, no dead young children. Uh, this one is fascinating. It is historical in the sense that it is set in the early 90s in Northern California, and thus it incorporates the real abduction and murder of Polly Class. And it was this, I, I didn't, I was reading it. I was like, oh, how strange. Why is this book set in, like, I think it was in 1994. And then I got to that. I was like, I know that name. And I was like, oh, this is real. And it's fascinating. It's, it's a detective who is investigating a missing girl case in Mendocino in California. And it, she, she crossed paths with the very real Polly Class case, but it's all, it's a book about missing girls, forgotten girls. The character herself carries, the main character carries a lot of trauma. Wait, there is, there is infant. Why was this a theme in 2021? So content warning and it's part of the setup at the beginning, the main character has lost a child. And so she, she carries a lot of trauma from that, but also she was a foster uh, child. Um, she lost her mother when she was young and she was sent to live with a, a loving, thankfully loving foster family in Mendocino. But that's what brings her back to Mendocino. Like she's called back, like there's this missing case and it's like the place she grew up um, in this small town on the coast of Northern California. And it's, it's her like investigating. And like, it, it's not like a page turning thriller. It really is like a slow burn uh, market suspense, but the, the lushness of the setting, like I, I loved the Northern California setting. And like, you can tell that the author lived there. She lived there for a while. And just like, you know, I love trees and you know, I love weather. And there was a lot of that in this. And it was just like character driven and like, feelings driven and it was just like a really beautiful reading experience and as I said it really stuck with me. I wouldn't say it's one where I wasn't surprised by the twist or anything like that. Um, in fact I, I guessed it pretty early on but that's not why I read this book. Like that's not why it was satisfying for me. Like as a character driven like setting driven suspense and theme driven essentially. Like I said it's all about like forgotten girls and like missing girls and the things that are done to girls and I I really I loved it I thought it was a really beautiful book so if you also tend toward or, or don't tend toward but are interested in but especially if you do like beautifully written character driven upmarket suspense I highly recommend when all the stars go dark now I only have one YA on the list and that is simply because I am horrifically behind in my TBR and there were a bunch of YA thrillers I didn't read in 2021 that I've been meaning to, but one of the ones I did read, I absolutely adored and more people need to read. It's really under the radar. When All the Girls Are Sleeping by Emily Arsenault. And this does kind of go in the, the theme with uh, a couple of the others, but also the, the one I just talked about. This was like a stick to my ribs kind of one where it it wasn't about how page turning it was, though when you get into like the, the past the halfway point, I was like, ferociously turning pages but it's an atmospheric book it is character driven it is emotions driven it made me cry which is super rare for me when I read books um and I've joked about it but I also mean it it is like the ghostier deeper version of a lot of the themes I was exploring in the IP <laughs> I, I just thought it was a beautiful book and I told I told the author this um like we're we're friendly and I loved a lot of the things it had to explore and say specifically about toxic girl friendships, like friendships of like, it's like when you're a teen and you get pulled into very specific types of friendships and you, you have to like really examine who you are in those friendships. I love those sorts of themes, but also it's just a darn good ghost story. I was creeped out reading this book. It's set in a creepy old boarding school with a legacy of ghosts. You know, every, every year people say that they see the winter girl, this ghost, 
and every not couple of years luckily not that frequently but there's a history at the school of girls dying like around the same time and it's most often connected to this ghost story and this character because her her former friend died the previous year after maybe seeing the ghost and she's she thinks that the, her friend might have seen this ghost and been driven to such like paranoia and fear that she jumped out of a window but the question mark is did she jump or was she pushed is there some other element here some a murder that happened here and she's driven to investigate and she goes in as a skeptic which i also appreciated because she's like there's not a ghost but she finds a facebook group of alumni from the school who swear that they saw the ghost and there are all these creepy stories and the kind that just literally raise i'm getting it right now that raise goosebumps on your skin um oh if you've ever been creeped out by the idea of waking up in your dorm room and there's someone in your closet I mean, read this book or don't read this book, but it was that kind of creepy imagery. Like it was like a really good, creepy, ghosty read, but it also ultimately is very character driven. It had some good twists, like like good twisty, especially at the end. And like it had things to say that I thought were really interesting and important. And as I said, it made me cry. I loved it. I think more people need to read this book. And it was definitely one of my favorites for 2021. My next favorite book is another one I've raved about all year long, and that is Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney. I just really like Alice Feeney. I had mixed feelings about her first book, Sometimes I Lie. But then his and hers just like was a home run and really scratched an itch and that was on my favorites list last year and then I read Rock Paper Scissors and I think it's her best book so far. Though in fairness I think his and hers and Rock Paper Scissors like scratch different itches and cover different tropes like they're almost like even keel but I adored Rock Paper Scissors. It has everything. It's isolation trope kind of. It's a couple on an anniversary trip in the middle of nowhere Scotland but there is a horrible snowstorm and so they're basically straight in this converted church Airbnb in the middle of nowhere and then creepy things start happening in the house and you're like what is happening so it's got that isolation trope aspect but it's also solid domestic suspense because you know going in he has face blindness so he has trouble distinguishing faces and she's lying about something you get that from the blurb and you're like and you're also going back and forth in time and that's a plot device I really like where you start at the first year of their marriage and you basically get every year on their anniversary his wife writes him a letter about like their last year and so you're getting a chronicle of their marriage leading up to this anniversary trip and it's that kind of like jumping around and there's also writer meta in it which we love the husband he is a screenwriter but like part of the like thing in their marriage was she always supported his writing and he was trying to get this original thing produced and it didn't happen but he was hired to adapt the best-selling novels of a mystery writer and when he did that his career blew up and then it starts causing problems in their marriage and there I just we love writer meta and so it has that aspect as well it has some really good twists some that you can spot and others where you're like it's got a good last page twist that like recasts the whole book that I really liked and I love those sorts of books with really messy people, isolated location, creepy things happening. I will tell you if you decide to read it there is a dog and the dog is fine. I was definitely you are always concerned when there's a dog. The dog is fine which also to the book's credit the dog is fine. I just think Alice Feeney is a real modern master of the genre. She's up there for me with Ruth Ware and I absolutely adored Rock, Paper, Scissors. Last and again in certainly no particular order is Survive the Night by Riley Sager. This one just really scratched an itch for me. I read it earlier in the year. I was in a bit of like a mood and a reading slump and it just pulled me through it. It did a lot of things that I really, really like. It had a bit of that isolation feel because it's a girl at college and her roommate was tragically murdered by a serial killer. <laughs> Whoops. And she wants to leave school, like withdraw from school. And she needs to get back to Ohio last minute, last minute decision. And she decides to hitch a ride with another student from her college. But she realizes like a little bit into the drive 
she's in a car with someone that she doesn't know. This is very early 90s, which is when it is set, because you're like, this probably wouldn't happen now, but it's early 90s, so you get the isolation trope of being isolated with someone who she doesn't know, and can she trust him? Who is this person giving her a ride? And it's like the slow building tension. I mean, it's, it's not that slow, but literally of, oh gosh, and they stop at a rest stop, and is she gonna get help, and who is this person? And then they go here, and you're like, oh my god, and then it it, it does these like twists and escalations of the tension that were pretty, I really loved. It just had set pieces that I really, really like that I won't share, because they're kind of spoilery, but that like hit on tropes and scratched particular itches for me as a reader that I really, really like. It also has this conceit that is kind of love or hate, but it ended up working for me. Part of the character's thing is that she has trauma and PTSD, first from her parents dying when she was younger, but also from, you know, her roommate being abducted and murdered. And she was the last person to see her roommate alive, but she cannot remember who went off with her roommate because of this little problem she has, which is part of her trauma response from when she was younger is when she gets really upset, she sees things happening like it's a movie. <laughs> basically like she hallucinates essentially and so she can't trust her own mind and memory and it's it's used pretty artfully in the book i i liked it and it adds this extra layer of an unreliable narrator and of course you as the reader and she eventually are going oh gosh you saw the person who abducted your roommate you don't know what they looked like because your mind did a hallucination, but they don't know that. Are you in the car with a serial killer? Why are you making these poor life choices? I liked that tension, and I'm since I'm a film fan, I liked that layer of meta as well, and I felt that it wasn't overused. And so it was just, it was just a book that really, really worked for me, and it's one of the better thrillers I've read in 2021. That's it. My favorite books is 2021. Um, I read fewer books than normal. I normally read like 50 to 60 and I don't even know if I got to 40 this year plus as I said just mood wise I really gravitated towards pretty dark harrowing things and you can kind of see that trend in the books that ended up being my favorites these all scratched a particular itch for me so if you two like some of the weird dark themes that I apparently really really like in books maybe you might enjoy picking up some of these as well I am going to have a partner video to this with my most disappointing reads of 2021, but I mean, sneak peek, because I didn't read as many books. It's not a full list. It's just a couple books, and it really is just like books that didn't meet my expectations for whatever reason, and I mean, you already will probably guess what some of them are, because you know some of the books I really didn't like in my various wrap-ups over the year, so look forward to that video. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and happy reading.